So welcome once again to the question paper analysis of UGC NIT English, December 2021, Shift 1. And this video is presented by Professor Academy, Chennai. And today we are going to discuss question number 16 to 20. All right, then let's go to question number 16. Given below are two statements. Statement one, linguists being primarily interested in the, you know, in the scientific study of language, approach language dispassionately. So that's statement number one. Statement number two, linguists are necessarily polyglots who bring their own biases to language study. Then we have options. Option A, both statement one and statement two are correct. B, both statement one and statement two are, sorry, first one is incorrect, second, correct. Then C, statement one is correct, but statement two is incorrect. D, statement one is incorrect, but statement two is correct. So how to deal with this question? Number one, you have to ask yourself whether the first statement is true. At least if one is true, you can eliminate two options. Linguist being primarily interested in the scientific study of language, approach language dispassionately. So what's the meaning? As you know, linguist or linguistics is a scientific study of language. And dispassionately, you should not bring any bias to the field. You should be neutral, objective. But the next statement contradicts the first statement, right? Linguists are necessarily polyglots. Polyglots are ones who know um, a lot of languages, who bring their own biases to language study. So you have to make a decision which is correct because there is some contradiction in the first statement between first statement and statement two. And let's go to the answer, then let's discuss. Answer C, statement one is correct, but statement two is incorrect. So for this kind of a question, you need a broad understanding of linguistics and that, and that will do. As I told you before, statement one, as everybody knows, linguistics is, a, is generally defined as the scientific study of language. As a scientific study, you have to be objective. You can't be prejudiced. And you not say that my mother tongue is superior to other languages. We can't make such statements in linguistics. A linguist should love all languages. A linguist should treat all languages as equals. So that is the you know, primary purpose of a linguist. He, should, uh, he or she should not be prejudiced. And sometimes linguists need not be polyglot. Sometimes they master a language. And of course, uh, they have some acquaintance with other languages. So it doesn't mean you have to say, of all the languages I know, this is the best language. That kind of a statement a linguist should not make. A linguist should treat all language equally and study equally, right? So, and if you know this, then it's easy, right? Statement one is correct. If you know this, then you can easily eliminate option A and option D. Then you are left with two options. Then you can come to a kind of a conclusion. Uh, since there is a contradiction, you can also eliminate option B. Then you'll be left with only C. Statement one is correct, but statement two is incorrect. So linguistics uh, sometimes is uh, defined as a systematic study of language. Why systematic study of language? Uh, because we take a particular field and rigorously we study its mechanics. For instance, these are the core branches of linguistics. First one, phonology, which is a study of speech sounds, the sounds we make. Then morphology, study of formation of words. So how we make words or form words. The word morph actually means a shape. So simply put, how we shape words or form words. Syntax is a study of sentence structures, then semantics, study of meaning. Pragmatics is a study of language in everyday context, how people use language in action or in everyday, in an in everyday context. So that is pragmatics. These are the core branches of linguistics. And if you are interested in learning linguistics, you can start with this book, uh, Jean Arch and Aitchison, J-E-A-N, Jean, Aitchison, A-I-T-C-H-I-S-O-N. Famous book, uh, simply put linguistics, uh, it was published by this um, publishers or series called 
teach yourself books. So I started my linguistics or this is how I acquainted myself with linguistics. So I started with this book, a very easy to approach book now in its uh, uh, latest edition, uh, the author has added a lot of new things. So you can begin um, linguistics with this book. Then you can also start with George Yule's The Study of Language. And most of the uh, most of the time, question setters go for this book, George Yule, The Study of Language. Okay. Then we have another book, Linguistics for Everyone and Introduction, Kristin Denham and Anne Lobeck, L-O-B-E-C-K. So you can use three books and this can be your source uh, for introduction to linguistics. Now let's go to the next question, question number 17. Which of the following words refers to a sound that is associated with a particular meaning? You have to pay attention. And again, this question is also you know, uh, related to linguistics, especially uh, phonetics and phonology. So options A, phoneme, B, phonemoid, C, phonisteme, D, phonic substance. So first you have to eliminate certain options. So if you have some acquaintance with the phonology, the first term we learn is actually phoneme, right? But what is the definition given here? A sound that is associated with a particular meaning. So the keyword is a particular meaning. So that's the keyword. And you know the last option doesn't sound good. Phon uh, phonic substance uh, doesn't seem a term. So you can eliminate that. So you'll be left with the three. Is it phoneme or phonemoid or phonisteme? Make a choice, then we'll go for the explanation. Answer C, phonisteme. Why it is not phoneme? Because phoneme is the minimal sound unit, like a, uh, or you say p. So a minimal sound unit in a language is called phoneme. It has nothing to do with a particular meaning. So you can eliminate that. Then we are left with two, B or C. Is it phonemoid or phonisteme? But let's check out phonisteme. What is a phonisteme? Before that, what is a phoneme? Phoneme, as I told you before, a minimal sound unit. For instance, in English, we have this, or uh, the phonology of British English, we have this sound. F. So how do you make this sound? You use your upper teeth and you bite your lower lip. F. And look at the words we have. Roof, stiff, cough, graph. But the letters are different. In the first word, we have only one letter. R O F, I, I, and we pronounce that letter as F. Then stiff, we have two F. Again, we pronounce it as F. Then we have cough, but we have letters G H. Again, we pronounce it as F. Then we go for graph P H. Again, we pronounce it as F. So whether it is F or double F or G H or P H. So what I am trying to say, these are letters. Sometimes letters, two or even three letters can make one single phoneme. So phoneme is a minimal sound unit. So you should not confuse phoneme with letters. So these are letters. All these letters are, we have, whereas G, H or F, uh, P, H, they represent one single phoneme. Maybe let's look at another example. And sometimes we have, uh, we, let's go for this phoneme, E, as in win. We have letter I, and that is pronounced E phoneme, win, or we have women. In, in this word, women, we have the letter O and we also have the letter E. Both are pronounced E, women, we, then E, women. Then we have the letter Y, M-Y-T-H, but again it is pronounced E, myth, or you have the letter U, but it is pronounced E, busy, or even the letter Y at the end of the uh, end of the word busy. So you have to be, you have to know the distinction between letters and phonemes. Phoneme, phonemes, they represent a sound unit. Letters are different, okay? So the phonology of British English, we have 44 phonemes, consonants 24 and bubbles 20. So sometimes if they go for a direct question, they may simply ask the phonology of British English, how many, uh, how many phonemes are there? The answer is 44 and sometimes they can confuse with the uh, uh, consonants and vowels.
Next, what is this Phonis theme? Because that's the question we got. First, we have to know, we have something called phonesthetics. So it's kind of a phonology or phoneme plus aesthetics. Aesthetics is a study of arts or beauty. So phonesthetics represents, or uh, it means the study of the aesthetic properties of sound. Let, let's, uh, let me explain. So we have phonesthem, P-H-O-N-A-E-S-T-H-E-M-E, -E -E, which represents a sound unit, fine. But it also represents a particular meaning, how? For instance, in English, whenever we go for this long E sound, E as in teeny, teeny. So whenever we say it is a teeny tiny, it means, it, you know, we represent, you know, it refers to something small or we go for weeny, W-E-E-N-Y. Now this sound carries some particular, you know, it has some meaning to it. And this is actually phonist theme. If we represent only the sound, then it is phoneme. But if some meaning is attached to that phoneme, then it is phonist theme. Here, this long vowel E represents smallness, something that's small. So when we say teeny, it refers to something which is tiny. Okay. So this is actually phonist theme, right? Now let's go for the sources. So if you want to uh, read about phonetics and phonology, you know, under linguistics, you can start with Peter Roach. It's a very good book. Uh, English Phonetics and Phonology, a practical course. Uh, I started um, with this book, actually. Mike Davenport and S.J. Hanex, Introducing Phonetics and Phonology. Um, I came across this book uh, in the library of uh, uh, Loyola College, Chennai. Then I fell in love with this book. So I started off uh, with this book. Then I went for uh, Peter Roach, English Phonetics and Phonology. But the book I always go to, or this is my go-to book, David Crystal's A Dictionary of Linguistics and Phonetics. Even the term, phonist theme, I looked up that word or the term in this book, A Dictionary of Linguistics and Phonetics. So if you want to know any term related to linguistics or phonetics, you can go to this dictionary by the master, David Crystal. Or if you want to say, no, uh, I want a book for beginners, then you have to go for Peter Roach, English Phonetics and Phonology. And this book, Mike Davenport and S.J. Hanex is a bit advanced, but it's a really good one. It covers, you know, even what, what, what is missed in the other book, you know, Peter Roach, okay? So with this, we'll go to the next question. Which of the following are true of the term performance as used in linguistic theory? So we have uh, four statements here. A, it is analogous to the Sashurian concept of lang. B, it refers to the specific utterances of individual native speakers in actual situations. C, it is an innate grammar that suggests humans' universal ability to use language. D, it includes hesitations and unfinished structures arising out of psychological difficulties acting upon the speaker. So these are the statements. Now let's go to the options. So our job is to find what is the meaning of performance when it comes to linguistics. So we have options, option A, B, sorry, A and B only. Then we go for option B. A and C only, then we go for option C, B and C only, then option D, B and D only. If you have some idea, so when we say performance, you know, it's like a practical thing, you know, uh, something that happens in a real situation. Then if you have, you know, even if you don't know, you know, this concept, you can come up with your own theory on the spot based on that word itself performance, you perform somewhere. So it has something to do with the actual situation. Or if you, you come to that conclusion, then you say, uh, you know, option B should be there. Then at least you can eliminate the option D. Uh, sorry, it's also there. Sorry, B. A and C only. So you can eliminate that. You can go for some, uh, some other option. right? But let's check out the answer and see the logic behind this question. Answer D. B and D only. So what is B? 
performance it refers to the specific utterances of individual native speakers in actual situation and d it includes hesitation and unfinished structures arising out of psychological difficulties acting upon the speaker so logical right performance refers to how you speak or the utterances you make in a uh, actual situation when you speak you also make hesitation for instance when i speak now sometimes i make pauses i take some time to make the next sentence so it includes hesitation and unfinished structures right so both are connected b and d are connected whereas a and c we don't know or let's see when we go for the explanation you will find this question very easy so we have a field called uh, semiology it's called the study of signs s i g n s so what is a sign sign is something that stands for something um, something else or simply put something that stands for other than itself for instance when i say a dog it doesn't draw attention to the letters d o g it actually refers to the idea of an animal called dog right so the word doesn't stand for itself but something else so that is a sign so a sign simply put it refers to something when i say a word it refers to an idea or a concept so a sign is made of two parts signifier and signified right so let's look at an example then we will uh, come to the definition so when i say tree t r e e or you can look at the screen you have you are now looking at the word tree t r e e so when you look at a word or when you hear a word the moment you see that word what comes to your mind when i say tree the idea of a tree you know comes to your mind in the shape of a tree right that's a kind of an image in your mind so that word t r e e that is the signifier so a signifier simply means the material form of a sign what is a material form when we say material something that you can feel something that is tangible why it is material why because now you are looking at it no it is perceivable you can see that t r e e or when i utter this word tree you can hear this so it is auditory as well as, as well as visual so it has some material quality to it it is tangible you can feel right so that is signifier the second one signified is the mental concept evoked by the signifier so you have this material form tree it invokes or it triggers this image in your mind and that image is actually signified it is a concept right mental concept evoked by the signifier so signifier signified so a sign is made of signifier and signified so this concept was put forward by uh, the swiss linguist ferdinand de saussure he gave a series of lectures and that like you know the, those lectures were compiled by his students and uh, published as a book course in general linguistics 1916 and because of this publication you know linguistic took a different turn so uh, sashur was also considered the father of modern linguistics because of his contribution something changed and because of his contribution you know linguistics attained the status of you know kinds of science that's why we call linguistic the study of you know the scientific study of language it's because of him and in his own words he defined signifier as sound image you hear and it's a kind of an image you see signify refers to concept that is evoked in your mind so not only tree if i say dog or if i say cat or if i say camel so something a kind of an image comes to your mind so the words dog cat or camel they are signifiers the image that you know respective images right and those are signified and another important concept there is no logic between signifier and signified why a tree is called a tree we don't know but in different languages we have different words in tamil we say maram right or latin obra again french obra we there is no logic why we should have no why why not we have the same word for this idea called the tree so there is no logic we follow the tradition someone told us it is tree right because that's how people have been calling that 
object or a maram or a abra then we follow it right so there is no logic why this object is called tree or why we call a dog dog we don't know so there is no logic so this is called arbitrary nature of sign arbitrary means illogical there is no logic there is no logical connection between signifier and signified now let's go to the other concepts by sashur so for sashur language is a system of semiotic differences so you compare and contrast two signs then we understand okay this is not that a cat is not a dog a dog is not a camel so we make meaning by or through differences so we compare and contrast signs so simply put that's one concept sign signifier signified and the arbitrary nature of sign now let's go to his uh, other two concepts major concepts lang l a n g u e the word lang actually means uh, tongue or tongue right so it is a system of signs you know anyone who speaks a language has a system of signs in his or her mind so it is a kind of a knowledge of how that particular language functions but here sashir is not only talking about language he is also talking about signs in general it can be a traffic sign or it can be the signs signs uh, used in a particular field so a person learns all these things with effort and this is a kind of a godown or a kind of a bureau it's a kind of a storehouse it's a kind of a brain so we collect everything it is there lang represents a system it's a kind of a storehouse of signs parole p a r o l e refers to how we make you know make use of certain signs in a particular context so simply put signs in use in everyday use for instance now i'm you know i'm explaining all these terms it doesn't mean these are the only words i know right uh, in english we know a lot of words but in this occasion i prefer certain words to explain these concepts so we, you can't uh, you know you can't come to a conclusion you know you know this guy you know this guy knows these many words no only particular occasion for this occasion i use certain words so this is called performance or parole but the word parole is used by sashur similar concept but chomsky uh, came up with different name so chomsky um, is known for his famous book syntactic structures published in 1957 you have to pay attention to the publication here a uh, publication year uh, 1957 because this book revolutionized the field of linguistics and he made this famous statement colorless green ideas sleep furiously you know syntactically correct we have colorless green ideas ideas it's a noun followed by verb sleep then furiously adverb so subject verb adverb right fine or adjunct but it doesn't make any sense how can ideas be colorless as well as green a kind of a contradiction can ideas sleep if at all furiously so chomsky said sometimes we can make you know a complete you know grammatically correct sentence but it may not make sense so he just criticized you know linguists have been studying only surface structure of a sentence they don't study the deep deep structure of a sentence right then he went for his uh, tg grammar transformational generative grammar and surface structure and deep structure but uh, for this class let's restrict ourselves to these two terms Ch uh, for chomsky competence refers to native speakers knowledge of the language so if you are if your mother tongue is tamil or malayalam each of you has a knowledge of your language your mother tongue all right so this is called competence a kind of you have a storehouse of knowledge of your own mother tongue then performance depends on the occasion we use certain words or certain phrases the performance refers to the specific utterances of speech so now you can compare and contrast it sounds similar right chomsky's competence is equivalent to sashur's lang and chomsky's performance is equivalent to um sashur's parole both are one and the same 
right? So Chomsky was inspired by Sashiv, simple. And both contributed to modern linguistics. Sometimes both are called father of modern linguistics. So if you have this kind of an um, understanding, then if you go back, just now read, it's an easy question, a straightforward question. Just read the question again. Which of the following are true of performance? You can immediately eliminate the first one. It is analogous to the Sashurian concept of Lang. No, right? Lang is more to do with, you know, a system of science. It's not performance, right? Uh, performance is associated with parole, not Lang. Then the next is correct. It refers to a specific utterance. Third, you can eliminate. It doesn't refer to an uh, innate grammar. Then with this knowledge, it's very easy. B and D. It's a direct question if know this, right? Now let's go for the next question. Who among the following is the founder of the survey of uh, English usage? Yes, E, U. Survey of English usage. A, Brian Garner. B, Henry Watson Fowler. C, Michael Swan. D, Randolph Quirk. Q U I R K. Let's go to the answer. D. Randolph Kirk. Q U R K. This is a research institute, survey of English usage. It's a research institute, and uh, uh, they have been working on linguistics, the field of linguistics, and they have been producing a lot of good works. And it was established by uh, Randolph Kirk in 1959, and he founded it at Durham University, then he moved to University College London, UCL. Now it is there, 1960, he, mo uh, he moved there. The survey of English usage, that research center is in University College London. And it is considered the first corpus linguistics research center established in Europe and second in the world. Now we have to understand something else. What is corpus linguistics? Okay, we get this information, piece of information that the survey, the survey of English usage, the department was, or uh, the center was established by uh, Randolph Quirk and it's now in University College London. But what is corpus linguistics? What is corpus linguistics? Corpus linguistic is the compilation and analysis of corpora. So then we have to ask another question, what is corpus? So corpus is a kind of uh, a large data, a body of data, a large body of text stored in an electronic database. If you want to understand this, why don't you check out any uh, online dictionary? Uh, I often use this dictionary, Lexico powered by Oxford. So if you just type linguistic in this uh, website, it gives a lot of options, a lot of data, not only definition, it also gives you synonyms, it also gives you, um, you know, uh, example sentences, and it goes on and on. And it also gives you suggestions. Look at the screen, we have linguistics, linguistic science, linguistic scientists, linguistic stock. So someone or a team has worked behind this um, uh, dictionary, right? And what they did, they have collected, put everything together. So once you type the word, or when you search, you know, the computer uh, brings it to you, right? The program bring, uh, bring, uh, brings that particular entry to you. So this is called corpus linguistic you know, creating a large body of text stored in an electronic database. And now you can understand if you go back, so this is what they do. The first corpus linguistics research center established in Europe. So they collect or they create databases. Now let's check out Randolph Quirk, a very important uh, linguist, especially this book, a comprehensive grammar of the English language. Um, he came up with this book uh, with uh, Sidney Greenbaum or Jeffrey Leach and uh, Jean Sabatik or Sabatwick. Uh, this is considered a masterpiece and the index for this book was created by David Crystal. I, a few years ago, I bought this book uh, for around 750 rupees. And it is no exaggeration, the title, a comprehensive grammar of the English language. It's a voluminous book. Everything that he wants to know about the English grammar is there. 
and this is the book uh, if you are interested in english grammar or mastering the english language this is the book you should often visit then we have another book by randolph quirk we have the use of english then he has also written this book and old english grammar with uh, cl ren right then let's check out the other options we have why this confusion why there is some logic um, uh, in the options see we have brian b r y a n brian a garner he was actually a lawyer an advocate uh, and he came up with this book garner's modern english usage then the famous h w fowler uh, a dictionary of modern english usage then we have michael swan known for his uh, easy to approach practical english usage so all came up with a book on english usage so that's the logic behind the question or the options so whether it's brian garner or h w fowler or michael swan now let's go to the last question in comparative philology and sometimes in modern phonology what is the term used to refer to the deletion of a vowel within a word so we need a term it ref referring to the deletion of a vowel within a word option a aphrasis a p h a e r e s i s b equi deletion c paradigm uh, d uh, syncopy uh, uh, sometimes we pronounce it wrong i used to pronounce this word wrong syncope no it is syncopy right uh, we have to go to the answer sometimes do not go for the obvious one so you may tend to think why not b equi deletion because the deletion deletion do you think that kind of uh, logic is there i don't think so sometimes do not go for the most obvious because that is deceiving right so let's check out the answer d sync copy so in order to understand this term let's go to first prosody there's a field uh, in uh, in literature called prosody or prosody p r o s o d y what is prosody uh, prosody refers to uh, the grammar of poetry so in uh, when you when we write poems we also go for meter uh, the most famous meter in english uh, poetry we have iambic pentameter so what is iambic or trochaic if you want to know about that we have we have to study prosody right so under prosody we have something called elision so what is elision the omission or slurring of a syllable right uh, under elision uh, elision is a broad term under elision we have two types first one is syncopy so syncopy refers to you now elimination or omission of uh, a letter or a syllable within a word for instance when we say heaven so we say we just remove the last you know uh, the vowel in the last syllable we have two syllable heaven so we remove the e so you go for a hyphen here heaven or we don't say heaven or heaven so the last syllable is removed so you remove a letter or a syllable within a word then that is syncopy like this one then we have another type synaresis s y n a e r e s i s what happens here it is not within word but it involves two words we have a, a word ending with a vowel then another word the following word begins with a vowel so we have two vowels back to back right two adjacent vowel sounds and in such a case sometimes we remove the first vowel or a single vowel or here the effect we have the ending with e then effect starting with e so what we do we just cut it out you know the e in the so we say defect we don't say the effect or defect right this is called synaresis so whenever we learn we have to learn some more so that next time you, you know next time they may ask for synaresis or elision or prosody all right so whenever we analyze um previous year question paper this is what you have to do one more about that point or one more option read one more or uh, collect a point one more point about that so that you are also parallelly preparing not only analyzing then let's end this class uh, with the uh, again the term but in phonetics so elision uh, as we discussed refers to the omission of a sound or syllable in pronunciation in english we can understand this concept uh, we have it is very easy right if you say want to go 
you slur you omit sounds like you say wanna go right want to go becomes wanna go or you say do not becomes don't so we omit sounds or syllables so this is an example from english it's also available in french in french the same concept uh, in french h is considered a vowel so we have a vowel before that we have this article l e then followed by h o m m e two vowel coming together so we eliminate or delete the first vowel so lo om becomes lom which means the man right it's also available in tamil so where we have a concept called sandhi sandhi is also available in other languages and in sandhi we have this specific uh, factor called elision of letters look at these two words here so we have a compound word muha bottom right so it refers to the tiredness we see in our face or sometimes uh, literally translate uh, kind of a literal translation the tiredness of a face kind of muga bottom we have two words muham and bottom right and we combine this into a compound a compound word but in the compound word a sound is missing elision of letter for instance muham am or im sound is here and this sound vanishes in the result so muham plus bottom becomes muha bottom mm that sound is deleted so this is also elision so this is linguistics as that's how we uh, behind this class or behind this discussion a linguist should not be prejudiced for a linguist any language or all the languages are equal and when we teach linguistics we should also consider all languages as equal uh, equals right so with this uh, let's uh, in today's class thank you so much and if you want to follow uh, professor academy's youtube channel please subscribe for further videos thank you so much see you tomorrow